So the, welcome, this is our eighth time gathering as the uh, uh, Romney on the menu and the purpose of this sponsored by the Historic Landmark Commission here in Romney was to sort of remember and celebrate the history of Romney. So welcome to Schaefer Funeral Home. You'll notice if you've been, how many of you have been in this room before? Or in this building before? What's missing? There you go. There's one thing missing, but we won't go there. Uh, but we're here tonight for another reason, and that's to celebrate the memory uh, of one of West Virginia's governors, whose home you are currently in. And Carter Wagner is not only the funeral director here now, but interestingly enough, and ironically as he'll share, he grew up in this home and shares a lot of history of this story. So without any further ado, um, uh, I'll turn you over, turn us over to Carter Wagner. Thank you all very much for coming. And yeah, we turned the chairs around intentionally because everybody, when they come in here for a funeral, we're always facing that way. And this is, um, I think, uh, I don't think any of us own anything. I think we're stewards of it for a period of time and we are charged with paying the taxes and in this case the mortgage. But um, I feel very blessed to, uh, to be the steward of, of the Cornwell Mansion. Um, I have to say, I've worked hundreds of funerals here but um, above and beyond that, I've had the best times of my life here. Keith and Isla Schaefer were the, just the finest people, and they had two children, Mark and Sarah. I'm in their age range, and um, I grew up in northern Virginia and would often come to Romney with my parents to visit my aunts and uncles. This is my father's hometown area. But anyway, um, there's lots and lots of stories to remember and things to tell. The people most qualified to talk about the home a long time ago are Sally C. She's the great-granddaughter of Governor Cornwell and Mrs. Cornwell. She's out of town. And her brother, um, he also is out of the area. They did send me some notes and memories and things that I'll share with you uh, in, in just a few minutes. And uh, as I said, I'd like this to be kind of conversational. You have a question or something you want to know? Uh, the house was built in 1914. Um, it's been described to me as mansion built based on its square footage. It had, I think, four separate septic systems when it was first built. It went out and you can still see the old pipes down in the basement. It has six fireplaces in it. And down in the cellar, uh, if we had more time, I'd take you down there and show you, there are enormous walk-in clean-out areas that are all brick, and uh, that's where each fireplace had a trap door, has a trap door in the bottom, and the coal dust could be swept in, down it would go, and there'd be somebody to clean it up. Um, my memories of the house go back to when I was about seven years old, so that takes me to 1966, and certainly I've asked a plethora of questions over the years of Glenn Shingleton and Isla and Keith and Mark and Sarah remember about what I do. But when the Cornwells lived here, it was built in 1914, coincidentally that was the same year they lost their only son. His, uh, a portrait or photo of him hangs on the staircase, you can notice that, and he was John Jr. And he was 18 years old and he was a uh, student at the Shenandoah Military Academy and contracted some type of a flu, whatever it was, it took his life at 18 years old. Same year the house was being built and completed. And it's interesting when you walk through this house and, and look around at different features, there are certain high signs that you think somebody was building something big and great and beautiful, and right at the tail end they lost enthusiasm, as you, I have to imagine parents would losing their only son. Um, people think just because something is really old, it's perfectly built and it's well built. Well, this is a solid old house, but I don't think you could find a right angle in it. If you go up on the third floor and Sarah's, no, excuse me, the hallway at the top of the stairs, the floor does this. There's no sign that it's sinking any place, so I think they had to have built it like that. <laughs> um, in, in my memory, um, besides there being funerals here, I, I, I think about Mark and I setting up racetracks down here, Hot Wheel sets, and uh, riding bikes through this place. And one time, uh, Mark and Sarah have a cousin, Mary Boyle, who lives out in San Diego. And she remembers uh, being down here and they were playing kickball in the front of the house. 
And her mother came down the stairs, Isla's sister, and said, wait till Keith Schaefer sees what you all are doing. Well, Keith was catcher over here in the corner. <laughs> so it did, it didn't, they didn't have too much uh, uh, repercussions from that. Um, let's see, what else? The, uh, I, I printed up some brochures that if anybody would like to have one, it's just some history of, of the house and some, some photographs. Um, I'd like to share with you what Sally sent to me, and they're the memories of. I'll take a couple of those. Sure. sure. These are the memories that Sally and John Ailes have, Sally C., uh, from them growing up. So these go back into the 40s and 50s. Does everybody know who Sally C. is and who John Ailes? They're the great grandchildren of Governor and Mrs. Cornwell. Anyway, she writes Hi, Carter. Here's a little information for your presentation. Please tell everyone I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I know you'll have a fun evening. Look this over and give me a shout if you have any questions. I've included my brother's memories for you also. Sally. My memories. My father, John Ailes, used to say he remembered the night granddad. She called her great-grandfather granddad. So that's what we're talking about him when I'm saying granddad. Granddad was elected governor. He was four years old at the time, meaning her father. Announcement of Granddad's successful bid for governor was sent by telegraph to the train station at the depot. A large crowd of well-wishers carrying burning torches arrived on the lawn of the house the night, that night to deliver the news. Granddad then stood up on the railing of the front porch and delivered a short speech. My grandmother, Sally Cornwell Ailes, held my dad up to the window for him to see. Number two, Mary Willis was the cook and her husband Blair was the chauffeur and butler. Earl Hines was the gardener and handyman. Footnote, stepping out of this for a minute, Isla Schaefer remembers that when she and Keith came to look at this house, right uh, when the estate was selling it in 1959, that when they went to, to the third floor where the, the, the help stayed, there was, used to be a staircase here in the center hall that went clear to the third floor, that somebody was asleep uh, in the middle of the afternoon, and whoever it was, the gardener, whoever, I think was sleeping off some of the remnants of the bottles we found in the cellar years later. <laughs> Anyway, um, she writes, Grandmother was a rather stout woman and once told my mother that God had given her an appetite and she intended for her to use it. <laughs> um, there, there's a wonderful picture hanging on the refrigerator and it's also in your brochure that before, the fum before Schaefer's bought it and in the back of the house where the office area is here and now the kitchen and the elevator hooks to that, um, that was a double-decker sun porch. And off of that was a beautiful trellis that went way out to the backyard and it was covered with, with, sty with wisteria. And um, Sally writes, I can remember riding my tricycle under the trellis behind the house that was covered in wisteria. That walkway led to the garden. There are still, um, what are those beautiful flowers that come up in the spring and have a wonderful scent? Narcissus? No, they're, um, not. Hyacinths? Hyacinths. Mm -mm. Daffodils? It'll come to me probably at 11 o'clock tonight. Um, anyway, she writes, We visited almost daily since we grew up in the house behind grandmother and granddad's. By the time I came along, granddad had had a stroke and was confined to, be to bed or a wheelchair. Grandmother had a stroke after he passed away. Uh, let's see. The sun porch on the back of the house where your office is was often used for Sunday family dinners rather than the formal dining room. The sun porch, where your kitchen is now, was often used for sleeping when grandchildren came to visit. Let me step out of this again. The room you're sitting in, this is the dining room. And the, uh, the room back here where everybody's accustomed to the casket being when you come for a visitation, um, that was Governor Cornwell's study. And there was just a narrower doorway going in, and it was, has all been opened up since the stairway was removed. That's really the only major alteration that Schaefer's did to this house, and I applaud that, that there's so much that could have been modernized over the years and hasn't been, so it still retains a lot of its original feel. Carter, how big was the lot here when you built the house? Do you know how big the area It was, see, it's, it, there, there's speculation on this. It went clear back to the little brick house that belongs to Royce and Sharon Seville now. That was John and... Um, John Ailes' home, and he built that. Somebody said, and I've been told, that Gravel Lane was the original old Route 50, years and years ago. 
and there was talk of opening it back up and running through the backyard of this house. He said, nothing doing, mm -hmm. and they built that little brick house right in the path of it. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but you can kind of see it making sense when you think of the Meitringer house being the oldest house, or I'm told, the oldest structure in Romney that you wouldn't have built off the main road back then, but I, I have nothing to substantiate that with. Uh, let's see, the governor and Mrs. Cornwell had three children. My grandmother, Sally, was the only one who lived to be an adult. A twin sister died at six months, and a brother, John Jr., passed away when he was 18. She married Eugene Ailes and had six children, Edna Jane, Stephen, John, Sally, Eugene, Gino, and Anne. All visited the house frequently. Sally lived with her parents for many years after her husband passed away. Let's see. Miss Susan Brady, grandmother's sister who lived on the corner where the bank of Romney now sits, was usually there for Sunday dinner. Okay, now John writes, these are John's memories. John has a colorful grasp of the English, and so what I'm going to read is a quote, or quotes, okay? This isn't my spin on things, but I didn't want you to lose his, uh, his flavoring, so to speak. Uh, his memories, walking with, his, walking with granddad back and forth from the office to house and eating lunch with him. Sitting in the library, talking to granddad. He would be in there listening to the radio and it was always dark. That was roughly where the bodies are displayed now. <clears throat> Visiting grandmother and finagling a quarter from her to buy a balsa wood airplane. She always had change in the top drawer of her bedstand. It was on the right side of her because she could only use her right hand. Playing with the elevator until A, our grandmother Sally, would come and rip my ass. Only two in town in those days, and one at the house and one at the office in the old Bank of Romney building. That elevator's been a, a source of joy and trouble uh, since it was put in in the late 40s for Governor Cornwell. He could no longer negotiate the steps, so he did what most of us would do, put an elevator in. Um, now, it, it still fascinates me, but... Uh, what happened? They built the elevator onto the sun porch because it would be too hard to come through any of the main walls of the house. So when Schaefer's um, bought and changed it to a funeral home or used the downstairs as a funeral home, this two-level sun porch was removed and that's where the office is now, the lobby, and the kitchen upstairs. And there's pictures of that. You can see that also in the in your brochure that opened up in the lower right-hand corner. You can see the double-decker sun porch over there. Uh, let's see. Sorry, Carter. So Sorry. that means the original kitchen was on the second floor. No, no. Uh -oh. The original kitchen's what's now the operating room. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to see it, I'll be happy to show it to you. Um, which is right behind this wall. The butler's pantry is open, and that's where you, you can look. There's a sink in there, and there's also the panel where they used to open to pass the food out to be staged in the butler's pantry and brought out here to the dining room. Uh, Schaefer's moved the kitchen upstairs when it was not possible to use this as living quarters. Uh, let's see, another memory. Sunday mornings visiting the kitchen to steal homemade roll dough while Mary was fixing Sunday lunch. She was reportedly almost blind. Not true. She caught me every time and ran me out of the kitchen. <laughs> Eating Sunday dinner, lunch with the elite. Always fried chicken, rolls and the trimmings and trying to behave. I was pretty young, five to ten and usually ended up eating in the kitchen. Uh, sleeping on the sun porch in the summer. That's the upstairs of what's out here. Hanging out with grandmother and Dickie the dog when she was tending her flower garden before she got sick. She later had a Pekingese named Jimmy that she spoiled rotten and would sneak bites of food from her plate to him at the dinner table. Hanging out with Earl Hines while he was working or talking with him in his third floor apartment. Aunt EJ and Uncle Marsh, Edna Jane and Marshall Sprague coming to visit and always talking Marsh into playing boogie-woogie on the piano in the front room. Playing ball in the yard with Dad and Gino. The pool table and ping-pong table were in the basement. I was in the house virtually every day when I was young during the 50s. Always some relative or visitor hanging around. And remember going to see Granddad when he was lying in state but wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. So, it's, 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 it's fun to have the memories shared of the people who grew up here or their family built the house. Um, does anybody have any questions about the house or its inhabitants? Or How many families have owned this house? Two. Well, two. three. If you call me a family. Right. Um, the, the Cornwells and the Schaefers bought it in 1959, and I think 
This is kind of a funny story. Uh, it was for $18,500 is what Keith and Isla paid for this. And Keith's dad or dad, father, Ray Schaefer, uh, was an insurance agent with Pancake Chevrolet. And he told Keith, you're out of your mind. You'll never be able to pay for that place. <laughs> and uh, so Keith and Isla went on and did it. They were down where... Um, at the end of Endor Avenue, where, who's in that building now? Um, Heritage Herring. I'm sorry? Heritage Herring. Heritage Herring, yeah, thank, where's Linda? <laughs> but, um, so yeah, Keith and I bought this in 1959 and, and moved up here and had to uh, do some rearranging and remodeling, let's say taking out the staircase. The uh, second part of the staircase that takes you from the second to third floor still exists. It's closed off on the third floor, but from the second floor you can look up and see, still see the steps. I'm a collector of lots of stuff, music and records and that kind of thing, so I use it as a stereo cabinet. You're welcome to walk upstairs and take a look. It's all lit up. Um, what else would be of interest? Anybody, any other questions? What other changes have you made personally? Uh, n well, yes. Uh, it, it's, it's, they're minor. When, when Sarah and I bought the funeral home back, it was sold out of the family in 2000 to the Warnicks. And um, Fred Warnick died very unexpectedly at his own hand in 2005 and left his wife here, who was not a funeral director, and Sarah was an employee, and uh, Glenn was still living at that time, and it was just a real awkward time for Schaefer's. I had recently sold my business in Northern Virginia, and I would help Sarah uh, on occasion. And we thought, let's buy it back. And Debbie Warnick was very happy to sell it back to us. Uh, Isla was living next door at the time, and um, she was delighted that it was back to being Schaefer's. That uh, I never felt the need to put my name out front. Uh, everybody will always think of this place as Schaefer's, and I always will. And. Um, that's kind of how I got to be here. How about the fireplaces? Did they work? Have you... uh, I had a chimney place come and look. They would all work, but they were never designed to burn logs. They were designed to burn coal. Right. And so uh, the expense of reopening the fireplaces, and sadly we get into liability issues and all that about having fire in a public place. And all, so we just leave them open and uh, to, you know, to admire and, and look at, but that's about it. Murder. Yes, sir. He said that was the dining room. This is the governor's study. What about this room over here? That was their kind of formal parlor okay. where uh, I think Sally said that's where the, or John said that's where the piano was. And um, <clears throat> they would receive friends and be seated. If somebody came to see the governor, be seated in there, and that's where he would, he would and speak was there. there a doorway here? The archway yes. now, was that a doorway? Yes. There were two doors into that room, one about where Eve is sitting that was under the stairs, and one there to your right. And I think they were a little smaller then. Um, if, if you'd like, and when you go upstairs and see, uh, that's where I live, and that's where the Schaefers lived, and it's hard for me to imagine ever being just two or three people living in this house and having this is your living area, and that is your, it's, it's, it's a lot of house. Mr. Marlin, yes sir. Uh, Conversations about the three items in in the room here. The, the, uh, the diving the divers, bell. The divers, Elmer and <laughs> Jamie gave that to me for my birthday, and I just think it's really cool. And that's <laughs> the reason it's the house. Was the, the other two? The mirror and the spit tune, I guess it is. Um, the the mirror uh, actually. Um, my my family, uh, the Schaefers, uh, my aunt Susan, Mary Susan Williams, and her husband Paul, who's long gone now are all um, big aficionados of Headley's auction in Winchester and are uh, Berryville now. But that came from, from Headley's. It's a bullseye mirror and they were originally designed to be used in a dining room and I'm told the reason that it's a convex mirror is so that the help could stand in one place and see everybody and what was going on in the room and who needed attention. There's, uh, as I think about it, Upstairs in the hallway, right outside my room, is a little round doorbell looking thing. And if you push it, a buzzer still goes off in the butler's pantry. That was Mrs. Cornwell's room. And she's the one who had the buzzer. 
I can stand up there all day and ring the buzzer and nobody shows up. <laughs> but, was that the only one? That was the only one. Yep. And um, when, when Sarah and I were here and sometimes we would work into the evening, the only thing that we ever used it for is I'd hit the buzzer twice to tell her that there was a cold glass of wine coming down on the elevator and she could get it off. And, <laughs> so I was serving somebody but using that to tell them about it. Um, Are there any items left? Interestingly enough, there is a champagne bottle in this dining room cabinet that's lit up. It's, it's green. Uh, there's nothing to prove this except it's been here all these years, and allegedly it was the champagne that the Cornwells enjoyed on their wedding night. The bottle of. Well, <clears throat> What's the story on the couch that came from the White House? This one. Oh, that one. Okay. Uh, evidently, um, there's, there's some artwork someplace that has this in it. But uh, my uncle Paul Williams bought it at an auction in Baltimore, where that's where they said this is out of the and this is back in the fifties. So it wasn't connected with the Cornwells. No, no, no. Total coincidence that uh, it wound up here and how and why. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world, and I don't think it's the most beautiful thing. But it's got an interesting <laughs> history. She looks comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Louise, you okay? Can I get you anything? <laughs> yes. Sir. I'm sorry. He, uh, the, Ham um, the Hampshire Review, as I recall, he was very active in the railroad. Um, he, he uh, there's a book or two right here, John J. Cornwell's Walk Around, Knock Around Notes or something like that. Knock Around Notes. Yeah, yeah. So anybody could share, well, not, I'm, I'm not much up on the history, the, Steve. The building where <clears throat> uh, Hills Insurance is now, it's a small building. Uh, I mean, I grew up here and went by it a thousand times growing up and never noticed it. But in 1980, the Hill family rented that to us uh, as a law office. <clears throat> and above the door, embedded in concrete, is a, a, a sign that says Cornwell Law Office. Uh, now, Mr. Hill, Bogey Hill, who I'm sure a lot of people go here knew, always referred to that building as the barber shop. When I would go in to pay the rent every month, he was saying, oh, you're paying the rent on the barbershop. <laughs> and when I grew up, it was, in fact, a barbershop. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has the, a plaque over the, a concrete plaque that says Cornwell Law Office. Now, whether that was the governor or his brother, uh, I never knew, but I always thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. No, I think that was, that was yeah. his yeah. office. Yeah. Yeah. What were the name Steve. of the notes again? What was what you call it? Knockabout notes. Knockabout. Oh, they, they used to publish those in the review from time to time. Yeah. I think there's actually three books that they wrote. I, no. I had to check at home. I'm pretty sure I got them, but. That's Fred Fields talking, and Fred is a collector of photographs, and like me, lots of stuff. And he came this evening wearing uh, Governor Cornwell's campaign pin, <laughs> and also came with an invitation to the Governor's Ball, I, inauguration night? Yeah, the inauguration it's a beautiful thing. I hope to get a copy of it to hang someplace. <laughs> Mr. Morrow? Steve didn't tell you all the story about the house. He was a favorite boy in town, the evening paper, but the Sunday paper was always in with the evening paper. The same boys delivered it. And the Sunday morning paper. Sunday morning paper. And it was usually dark when they delivered the morning paper up here. And it wasn't the most comfortable place for them to be. For a 10-year-old kid to come by the funeral. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, two young <laughs> o'clock in the morning. Too young to be paper boy, but he had to deliver <laughs> some papers. <laughs> Anything. That, well, you know, I don't remember. I remember being very young, and um, Keith and Glenn were just incredible pranksters. And um, there's been as much fun had in this house as there have been sad events in terms of it being a funeral home. But uh, one time, Mark and I were left to answer the phones, and Keith was going to play cards, Isla was at choir practice, and Sarah was supposed to be at the library. And Mark and Carter are upstairs in the TV room, over the, uh, the operating room, and it's uh, 7 o'clock in the evening, dusk, and the doorbell rings. So Mark and I come down the steps, boop, 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 nobody there. Well, somebody rang the doorbell and rang back upstairs rang the doorbell again. Now we're like, this is a little strange. Now, we're nine and ten years old, we'll keep that in mind. Down the stairs we come, nobody there. 
So it's like, we, now we're thinking, well, they're still in the neighborhood because they did it twice. So we go back in the TV room, watching TV, and the timer goes off on the stove in the kitchen. Now it's getting really weird. And we go in and turn the timer off. Back in the TV room. Now Mark had his BB guns on a rack, a pegboard rack in the TV room. And the and I may be missing a step or two here, but the next thing that goes off is the alarm clock in Keith and Isla's room right next door. So now we're like, they're in the room. <laughs> so Mark gets his BB gun down. You couldn't have gotten a nickel between the two of us. And out the door and in and Mark goes. I don't know who you're, who you are, or where you are, but I've got a gun. And from under the bed, no, don't shoot, Mark, it's me. It was Sarah. <laughs> come back, and she was going all around the house, turning stuff off and on, and was hiding under her parents' bed. <laughs> and you know, when Glenn one time did it to us, he got chains in the elevator shaft. And <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're going to scare somebody, this is the place to do it. And um, another one, that another favorite. Glenn was really, really jumpy. You could walk up behind him and just touch him, and he'd go out of his skin. And in the summertime, it was common for the front porch to be a gathering place. Keith would lay out there on a sofa and sleep, or he'd visit in the evenings. Well, one evening the phone rang, and this is long before cell phones and portable phones. This is when there was a uh, the bell up under the eaves in the back of the house, and when the main line rang, you could hit like a school bell almost mm -hmm. out. So Keith got up to come in to answer the phone. And he did. Well, while he was in here, uh, he always kept a stash of stuff like this. Firecrackers, a whole s string of them. And he got two of them out and twisted them together. And he went out the front door. Now, Glenn's sitting out at the corner here with his back to this part of the house. And Keith takes his cigarette and lights that firecracker and lets it zzz and throws it. And it goes off right beside Glenn. Well, Isla still can't tell this story without, she can't even get through it without laughing. Now, this is 40-some years ago, but Glenn was climbing the air and trying, and he was mad with Keith for two days, but eventually he saw the humor in it. But again, um, there's, there's been lots of events held in this house, whether it's hospice or the Rotary or New Year's parties. Um, I, I think back, I see Suzanne Knight sitting back there, and when Roy was introducing the house and the program and, and me, that uh, Roy and Suzanne are just part of our family. And um, one new year, we had a New Year's party, and uh, to kind of kick things off, or, and during the early hours of the evening, Suzanne stood in the hallway and sung Bless This House a cappella. And it's still just, it was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, so anyway, I, I think when you leave here that, yeah, there's a sign out front that says Funeral Home. But this really is a, a rich part of Romney's history. I feel so blessed to be a part of it. Um, I never ever dreamed when I was a child I'd get to call this home. Carter, I have to yeah. add to that story. After those, I don't know how many years I've hosted the, that New Year's Eve, a New Year's Eve party here in the community. But then I would go and talk with people, my friends from other parts of the state. What did you do New Year's Eve? I said, I went to a party at a funeral home. <laughs> <laughs> and you could hear their eyes questioning us as, oh, we had a great time. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yes. Carter, how large is the original building, the living space, and uh, maybe how large is it today? Well, I encourage you to walk through the whole house. Um, give me a few minutes once we break up, get a Coke. No, I, I meant like square footage. The house. I, mean, I, I think it's just shy of 8,000, something like that. Wow, that's big. Well, you, you know it, you get the heating and cooling bills for this place. Oh, yeah. I, I, I see it's from Potomac Edison, I put oxygen on it for it. <laughs> you have to open up the fireplace. Oh my, yeah, yeah. You have to love this house, believe me. Um, some things you might want to look at as you're wandering around, certainly the portraits of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cornwell, but um, right behind Judy, there in the hallway, there's a picture taken out here, and well, let me get it and I'll point to some things. Excuse me. 1914 to 1918. Does that sound right? Yes. World War I. 1914 to 1918. In this picture, the, this has to be. When, how old is Sally C? Does anybody know? She wouldn't mind me asking that. It's, 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 
Around 70. Is she? Okay. So she's an infant right here in her dad's arms. She's standing up and he's kind of holding her. But Governor Cornwell's the elderly man, and uh, Mrs. Cornwell's right beside, and it's taken out here um, beside the carport. You can see vines growing up, they're not there any longer, and the house in the background, and lots of greenery. But it says who everybody is here. All of, um, there's Sally, their only daughter, and then she had a number of sons, and then on and on it went. But it's, it's, it's a fun picture to look at, and I encourage you to do so. Um, Somebody asked about furniture in the house. Uh, the only, I don't think we, there's any furniture in the house right now that was part of the Cornwells. A number of pieces over at Isla's house uh, are there. There's a bed, um, there's a dresser, uh, and a couple of other things that uh, I hope someday will find their way back. But uh, they're, they're all, you know, pretty well marked and tagged and everybody knows what's what. What's the style of this house, do you know? I did. And just went out of my head. <laughs> it's written in here. I Greek think. Revival, Thank it? you, it Steve. New, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's in front of those Greek families, from the old That's Greek families from Rome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you have asked a little about the please. biography of the governor. It, I think it's interesting. Please, so everybody we're, can hear. Come on. We're, we're in the 100th anniversary of the armistice of World War One, and he was governor of West Virginia at that time, and he was the man who was responsible for instituting the draft in West Virginia, and also for seeing that a number of programs were carried out. It's hard for us to believe now, but during World War I, every man between, and I can't remember exactly the ages, but something like eight, between 18 and 40, was required to work 36 hours a day. And if they didn't, then a they week. were reported. A week. A week. A week. Excuse me. A week. <laughs> yeah. That's not like my day. Yeah. No, they, oh, and, a lot of them would up here. And so Governor Cornwell was the, the man who had to oversee all of these programs. And of course, he came back here often uh, during the uh, the war, uh, and while and while he was governor, you know, as his this was kind of his you know home away from the office, so to speak. So there is a lot of history that went on during the time that he was. Uh, governor and living here in, in this house. Created the West Virginia State Police. Did he? Governor yeah. Cornwell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> okay. uh, you learned yeah. something. Yeah. Sally said, I thought you were going to go there with about the statue. But Sally told me uh, when we started talking about the Doughboy in front of the courthouse that it came up that the review put it there. And when I talked to Sally about it, she said, well, what happened is when the war was over, her great-grandfather would be, felt so badly about instituting the draft and sending so many West Virginia young men to fight in World War I that he wanted to do something in their memory, and that's why the review put the Doughboy statue in front of the old courthouse. It's interesting because there's an article in the review um, just around the time of armistice that says that a number of counties in West Virginia have already started to arrange for a statue and this little cut, last sentence in the thing is perhaps Hampshire County should you know, do the same. So you know, he did it. That's, that's what she told me. I, I remember now too, Carter, and I'm sure a lot of people here in the, in the room do, uh, and I don't know if it was when they, before they did the less ruminous column in the review, but I remember when they used to publish the, the governor's old knockabout notes. I mean, they were reprinted. Yeah. From, you know, they were articles from like the 20s or 30s, but they were, this has been like the 60s or 70s. They re reprinted them in there. Yeah. Anybody have other questions or memories that I don't have? <clears throat> Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, if you'd like to wander through the house. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that um, my aunt who couldn't be here was telling me that her mother, who lived next door, remembers before the house was built that it got very water collected in this area and that she was ice skating on this very spot. Well, that makes perfect sense, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Louisa, because Jack Haynes, who I should have thought to invite over to this, remembers 
um, certainly not before the house was built, but things his parents told him. And it makes perfect sense that the creek that came down off the hill ran right down through here and down where it is now. Um, when this house was built, um, they built in a drain system to take water out to the storm sewer. And uh, it still worked. However, if we had a lot of rain, the basement, I've, I've never seen it flood, but I've seen somebody hammered out little concrete channels where the water ran, and it would take it all to that drain at the front of the house. Well, about eight years ago, I couldn't stand that anymore. So we had the people come in, and they jackhammered up all around the outer perimeter and dug down and put gravel and drain tile and two sump pumps, so the basement's dry now. But the little trails are still there, and you can see where they went, and I know what they're for. But, um, what kind of floor is it in the basement? It's just concrete, and there's some tile. There's an area that's raised tile. Like, we know it's going to get wet, but we can put stuff in here and know the water won't hopefully come over this. So, um, another interesting guess, a feature about the house. Um, you can tell I've never done much of this, but speaking, but uh, when you go up on the third floor, if you do that, and you're taller than about five foot six, be careful, because they weren't very considerate of how tall the help might be because you can brain yourself uh, on part of it when you come down the stairs. But up on the third floor is the only place I've seen evidence of, and there's, they still exist, the gaslight fixtures. <laughs> I understand electricity was pretty much new to Romney in 1914 and that well, for whatever reason they did not run electricity to the third floor. The help had gas lights and that was it. The electricity was on bedroom level and this level and that was it. So the heated by cold, is there, oh, there was a there was, there was a cold steam boiler downstairs. They heated the house with steam. The radiators were taken out of this room, but they still exist in every other room. Oh, okay. And that's the way we still, we don't use steam heat anymore. We have flash boilers, but still there's hot water running all through the house. Mm -hmm. Were there any other outbuildings? Uh, just the garage. And it used to be that Anago, the street that runs beside here, behind the garage was much lower. And the garage had panel doors, three of them, that were on a track. And you open one door a little bit, and you could sh I can still see Key Schaefer sho shoving the doors, and they would slide and turn and line themselves up in the garage. And there were four sets of those, so that, in theory, um, Governor Cornwell had a Packard, I'm told, and that they would open the doors on both sides so you could pull in off of Anago, and the car would be backed in to come out and down the driveway. Where was, the, where was the barbershop? Oh, okay. Um, what Charlie's asking about is where uh, No Lewis had it. He moved his barbershop to, and it turned out when they were tearing it down, it was a log cabin. Mm -hmm. It was about 10 feet off the garage. There was used to be a narrow alley. Now it's just all parking lot. But there was a narrow alley. And does everybody remember No Lewis or who does? Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, he was quite a character. He was had a barbershop downtown. My father's 94 uh, and still enjoys incredible health and memory. Mm -hmm. And he remembers, um, he said, if you got in a barber chair with no Lewis, you didn't know when you were going to get out because he'd get halfway through your hair, haircut and say, now, boy, I'm going to play you a little tune on my trumpet. And he said <laughs> that no Lewis would be eating un raw onions oh. and blow on your neck. And you know, that, <laughs> it's just one of those memories that only a kid would have to get in their haircut. <laughs> but... Um, I have good memories of Nob. In fact, Nob was a character. He um, he liked to play his little magic chord organ and sing, and he even went to Pittsburgh and had a couple of records made of him singing and playing the organ. I've got one upstairs uh, someplace. But, and, and also, when that house was being torn down, because we had lots of Nob stories, he had hand-painted an exit-only sign, and Mark salvaged that and gave it to me because it was Nob's, and it's hanging in the TV room. He also ate raisins while he cut hair. <laughs> Which disgust, my mother would send the boys to get haircuts and it would disgust her to no end that he could eat raisins and cut hair <laughs> at the same time. Now Romney's full of characters. <laughs> Anybody else? If not, thank you. He had Raynell's beauty shop in the side of the house, the little white house up back through the that's where Keith Schaefer was raised. And um, she was a character's character. She, uh, she smoked like a furnace, but she had the 
the drapes take, or the curtains taken down in her house once a, once a month to be laundered and pressed, and everything had to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And Keith was an only child, and I don't think it was easy being Nell's son. How much did uh, she weigh? Uh, like 40 pounds. <laughs> there was just nothing to her. But everybody respected her. She was, um, she was, she was quite a lady. Yeah, boss is one word for her. Yeah, she was aggressive. <laughs> she was assertive. Yes, she certainly was. But, uh, Assertive. No. <laughs> Isn't that a nice way of putting it? <laughs> yeah, he said boss. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> She's watching. <laughs> Back in the day, this was the butler's pantry, and a lot of the original cabinetry still exists. It's been altered in a place or two when this drop ceiling was put in. But of uh, particular interest is the passageway that's still open on this side, but closed on the other. This is where food was passed through, staged in this room, and then carried out to the dining room. Keith Schaefer's first cousin, um, Bob Carter was married to a lady named Vicki. She died in her 40s of cancer. But back in the 70s, she took a snapshot and went home, and she sketched this. You can see Vicki uh, down here, 1974. But of particular interest, in the trees, she incorporated as the branches and leaves everybody's names. Mark, Sarah, Glenn, Keith, Nell. They're all in there, if you stand here and look closely enough. Um, if you were looking for, there's Mark, there's Glenn, there's Sarah. Is he Sarah? Oh, let's see if I can get it. Oh, yeah, I would say. Look at all the little ones. Look how little you get. Yeah. Do you all have a family? Where can you go? 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 Where can Okay. Um, this was added then? Yeah, this was opened up. Okay, so I'm walking in. Right? This hasn't changed. Not right? right? This hallway looks like this. Right. I'm walking in. I'm just reading something. So I'm going to go over here.